Chapter Eleven of Jill the Reckless by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Mr. Pilkington's Love Light. One. The rehearsals of a musical comedy, a term which embraces musical fantasies, generally begin in a desultory sort of way at that curious building bryant hall on sixth avenue just off forty-second street there in a dusty uncarpeted room simply furnished with a few wooden chairs and some long wooden benches the chorus or in the case of the rose of america the ensemble sit round a piano and endeavour with the assistance of the musical director to get the words and melodies of the first act numbers into their heads this done they are ready for the dance director to instil into them the steps the groupings and the business for the encores of which that incurable optimist always seems to expect there will be at least six later the principals are injected into the numbers and finally leaving bryant hall and dodging about from one unoccupied theatre to another principals and chorus rehearse together running through the entire piece over and over again till the opening night of the preliminary road tour to jill in the early stages rehearsing was just like being back at school she could remember her first schoolmistress whom the musical director somewhat resembled in manner and appearance hammering out hymns on a piano and leading in a weak soprano an eager baying pack of children each anxious from motives of pride to outball her nearest neighbor the proceedings began on the first morning with the entrance of mr salzburg the musical director a brisk busy little man with benevolent eyes behind big spectacles who bustled over to the piano sat down and played a loud chord designed to act as a sort of bugle blast rallying the ladies of the ensemble from the corners where they sat in groups chatting for the process of making one another's acquaintance had begun some ten minutes before with mutual recognitions between those who knew each other from having been together in previous productions there followed rapid introductions of friends nelly bryant had been welcomed warmly by a pretty girl with red hair whom she introduced to jill as babe babe had a willowy blonde friend named lois and the four of them had seated themselves on one of the benches and opened a conversation their numbers being added to a moment later by a dark girl with a southern accent and another blonde elsewhere other groups had formed and the room was filled with a noise like the chattering of starlings in a body by themselves rather forlorn and neglected half a dozen solemn and immaculately dressed young men were propping themselves up against the wall and looking on like men in a ballroom who do not dance jill listened to the conversation without taking any great part in it herself she felt as she had done on her first day at school a little shy and desirous of effacing herself the talk dealt with clothes man and the show business in that order of importance presently one of the young men sauntered diffidently across the room and added himself to the group with the remark that it was a fine day he was received a little grudgingly jill thought but by degrees succeeded in assimilating himself a second young man drifted up reminded the willowy girl that they had worked together in the western company of you're the one was recognized and introduced and justified his admission to the circle by a creditable imitation of a cat fight five minutes later he was addressing the southern girl as honey and had informed jill that he had only joined this show to fill in before opening on the three-a-day with the swellest little song and dance act which he and a little girl who worked in the cabaret at geisenheimer's had fixed up on this scene of harmony and good fellowship mr salzburg's chord intruded jarringly there was a general movement and chairs and benches were dragged to the piano mr salzburg causing a momentary delay by opening a large brown music-bag and digging in it like a terrier at a rat-hole conversation broke out again mr salzburg emerged from the bag with his hands full of papers protesting children children if you please less noise and attend to me he distributed sheets of paper act one opening chorus i will play the melody three four times follow attentively 
then we will sing it la 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 and after that we will sing the words so he struck the yellow-keyed piano a vicious blow producing a tinny and complaining sound bending forward with his spectacles almost touching the music he plodded determinedly through the tune then encored himself and after that encored himself again when he had done this he removed his spectacles and wiped them there was a pause is he observed the willowy young lady chattily leaning across jill and addressing the southern girl's blonde friend has promised me a sunburst a general stir of interest and a coming close together of heads what is he sure is he well he's just landed the hat check privilege at the saint aria you don't say he told me so last night and promised me the sunburst he was admitted the willowy girl regretfully a good bit tanked at the time but i guess he'll make good she mused a while a rather anxious expression clouding her perfect profile she looked like a meditative greek goddess if he doesn't she added with maidenly dignity it's the last time i go out with the big stiff i'd tie a can to him quicker and look at him a murmur of approval greeted this admirable sentiment children protested mr salzburg children less noise and chatter of conversation we are here to work we must not waste time so act one opening chorus now all together la 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 tum tum tumty tumty tum tum tumty mr salzburg pressed his hands to his ears in a spasm of pain no 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 sour 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 once again la 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 a round-faced girl with golden hair and the face of a wandering cherub interrupted speaking with a lisp mr salzburg now what is it miss trevor what sort of show is this a musical show said mr salzburg severely and this is a rehearsal of it not a conversation once more please the cherub was not to be rebuffed is the music good mr salzburg when you have rehearsed it you shall judge for yourself come now is there anything in it as good as that waltz of yours you played us when we were rehearsing mind how you go you remember the one that went a tall and stately girl with sleepy brown eyes and the air of a duchess in the servants hall bent forward and took a kindly interest in the conversation oh have you composed the varlts mr salzburg she asked with pleasant condescension how interesting really won't you play it for us the sentiment of the meeting seemed to be unanimous in favor of shelving work and listening to mr salzburg's waltz oh mr salzburg do please someone told me it was a pipertino i certainly do love waltzes please mr salzburg mr salzburg obviously weakened his fingers touched the keys irresolutely but children i am sure it would be a great pleasure to all of us said the duchess graciously if you would play it there is nothing i enjoy more than a good varlts mr salzburg capitulated like all music directors he had in his leisure moments composed the complete score of a musical play and spent much of his time waylaying librettists on the rialto and trying to lure them to his apartment to listen to it with a view to business the eternal tragedy of a music director's life is comparable only to that of the waiter who himself fasting has to assist others to eat mr salzburg had lofty ideas on music and his soul revolted at being compelled perpetually to rehearse and direct the inferior compositions of other men far less persuasion than he had received to-day was usually required to induce him to play the whole of his score you wish it he said well then this waltz you will understand is the theme of a musical romance which i have composed it will be sung once in the first act by the heroine then in the second act as a duet for heroine and hero i weave it into the finale of the second act and we have an echo of it sung off stage in the third act what i play you now is the second act duet the verse is longer so the male voice begins a pleasant time was had by all for ten minutes ah but this is not rehearsing children cried mr salzburg remorsefully at the end of that period this is not business come now the opening chorus of act one and please this time keep on the key before it was sour sour come la 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 mr thalthberg miss trevor there was an awfully sweet foxtrot you used to play us i do wish some other time some other time we must work come la 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 
i wish you could have heard it girls said the cherub regretfully honest it was lalapalutha the pack broke into full cry oh mr salzburg please mr salzburg do play the fox-trot mr salzburg if it was as good as the varlts said the duchess stooping once more to the common level i am sure it must be very good indeed she powdered her nose and one so rarely hears musicianly music nowadays does one which fox-trot asked mr salzburg weakly play em all decided a voice on the left yes play em all bade the pack i am sure that would be charming agreed the duchess replacing her powder-puff mr salzburg played em all this man by now seemed entirely lost to shame the precious minutes that belonged to his employers and should have been earmarked for the rose of america flitted by the ladies and gentlemen of the ensemble who should have been absorbing and learning to deliver the melodies of roland trevis and the lyrics of otis pilkington lolled back in their seats the yellow-keyed piano rocked beneath an unprecedented onslaught the proceedings had begun to resemble not so much a rehearsal as a happy home evening and grateful glances were cast at the complacent cherub she had it was felt shown tact and discretion pleasant conversation began again and i walked a couple of blocks and there was exactly the same model in schwartz and gulderstein's window at twenty six fifty he got on forty-second street and he was kind of fresh from the start at sixty-six he came sashaying right down the car and said hello patootie well i drew myself up even if you are my sister's husband i said to him oh i suppose i got a temper it takes a lot to arouse it you know but i can get pretty mad you don't know the half of it dearie you don't know the half of it a one-piece bathing suit well you could call it that but the cop at the beach said it was more like a baby's sock and when so i said listen izzy that'll be about all from you my father was a gentleman though i don't suppose you know what that means and i'm not accustomed hey a voice from the neighbourhood of the door had cut into the babble like a knife into a butter a rough rasping voice loud and compelling which caused the conversation of the members of the ensemble to cease on the instant only mr salzburg now in a perfect frenzy of musicianly fervour continued to assault the decrepit piano unwitting of an unsympathetic addition to his audience what i play you now is the laughing trio from my second act it is a building number it is sung by tenor principal comedian and sobrette on the second refrain four girls will come out and two boys the girls will dance with the two men the boys with the sobrette so on the encore four more girls and two more boys third encore solo dance for specialty dancer all on stage beating time by clapping their hands on repeat all sing refrain once more and off last encore the three principals and specialty dancer dance the dance with entire chorus it is a great building number you understand it is enough to make the success of any musical play but can i get a hearing no if i ask managers to listen to my music they are busy if i beg them to give me a libretto to set they laugh ha ha mr salzburg gave a spirited and lifelike representation of a manager laughing ha ha when begged to disgorge a libretto now i play it once more like hell you do said the voice say what is this anyway a concert mr salzburg swung around on the music stool a startled and apprehensive man and nearly fell off it the divine afflatus left him like air oozing from a punctured toy balloon and like such a balloon he seemed to grow suddenly limp and flat he stared with fallen jaw at the new arrival two men had entered the room one was the long mr pilkington the other who looked shorter and stouter than he really was beside his giraffe-like companion was a thick-set fleshy man in the early thirties with a blond clean-shaven double-chinned face he had smooth yellow hair an unwholesome complexion and light green eyes set close together from the edge of the semicircle about the piano he glared menacingly over the heads of the chorus at the unfortunate mr salzburg why aren't these girls working mr salzburg who had risen nervously from his stool backed away apprehensively from his gaze and stumbling over the stool sat down abruptly on the piano producing a curious noise like futurist music i we why mr goble mr goble turned his green gaze on the concert audience and spread discomfort as if it were something liquid which he was spraying through a hose the girls who were nearest looked down flutteringly at their shoes those farther away concealed themselves behind their neighbours 
Even the Duchess, who prided herself on being the possessor of a stare of unrivalled haughtiness, before which the fresh quailed and those who made breaks subsided in confusion, was unable to meet his eyes, and the willowy friend of Izzy, for all her victories over that monarch of the hat-checks, bowed before it like a slim tree before a blizzard. Only Jill returned the manager's gaze. She was seated on the outer rim of the semicircle, and she stared frankly at Mr. Goble. She had never seen anything like him before, and he fascinated her. This behavior on her part singled her out from the throng, and Mr. Goble concentrated his attention on her. For some seconds he stood looking at her. Then, raising a stubby finger, he let his eye travel over the company, and seemed to be engrossed in some sort of mathematical calculation. Thirteen, he said at length. I make it thirteen. He rounded on Mr. Pilkington. I told you we were going to have a chorus of twelve. Mr. Pilkington blushed and stumbled over his feet. "'Ah, yes, yes,' he murmured vaguely. "'Yes.' "'Well, there are thirteen here. Count them for yourself.' He whipped round on Jill. "'What's your name? Who engaged you?' A croaking sound from the neighborhood of the ceiling indicated the clearing of Mr. Pilkington's throat. "'I, er, I engaged Miss Mariner, Mr. Goble.' "'Oh, you engaged her.' He stared again at Jill. The inspection was long and lingering, and affected Jill with a sense of being inadequately clothed. She returned the gaze as defiantly as she could, but her heart was beating fast. She had never yet been frightened of any man, but there was something reptilian about this fat, yellow-haired individual which disquieted her, much as cockroaches had done in her childhood. A momentary thought flashed through her mind that it would be horrible to be touched by him. He looked soft and glutinous. "'All right,' said Mr. Goble, at last, after what seemed to Jill many minutes. He nodded to Mr. Salzburg. "'Get on with it, and try working a little this time. I don't hire you to give musical entertainments.' "'Yes, Mr. Goble, yes, I mean no, Mr. Goble.' "'You can have the Gotham stage this afternoon,' said Mr. Goble. "'Call the rehearsal for two sharp.' Outside the door he turned to Mr. Pilkington. "'That was a fool trick of yours, hiring that girl. Thirteen. I'd as soon walk under a ladder on a Friday as open in New York with a chorus of thirteen. Well, it don't matter. We can sack one of em after we've opened on the road. He mused for a moment. Darn pretty girl, that, he went on meditatively. Where did you get her? She, uh, came into the office when you were out. She struck me as being essentially the type we required for our ensemble, so I, er, engaged her. She, Mr. Pilkington gulped, she is a charming, refined girl. "'She's darn pretty,' admitted Mr. Goble, and went on his way, wrapped in thought, Mr. Pilkington following timorously. It was episodes like the one that had just concluded which made Otis Pilkington wish that he possessed a little more assertion. He regretted wistfully that he was not one of those men who can put their hat on the side of their heads and shoot out their chins and say to the world, "'Well, what about it?' He was bearing the financial burden of this production. If it should be a failure, his would be the loss.' yet somehow this coarse rough person in front of him never seemed to allow him a word in the executive policy of the piece he treated him as a child he domineered and he shouted and behaved as if he were in sole command mr pilkington sighed he rather wished he had never gone into this undertaking inside the room mr salzburg wiped his forehead his spectacles and his hands he had the aspect of one who wakes from a dreadful dream children he whispered brokenly children if you please once more act one opening chorus come la 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 chanted the subdued members of the ensemble two by the time the two halves of the company ensemble and principals melted into one complete whole the novelty of her new surroundings had worn off and jill was feeling that there had never been a time when she had not been one of a theatrical group rehearsing the pleasant social gatherings round Mr. Salzburg's piano gave way in a few days to something far less agreeable and infinitely more strenuous, the breaking in of the dances under the supervision of the famous Johnson Miller. Johnson Miller was a little man with snow-white hair and the Indian rubber physique of a juvenile acrobat. Nobody knew actually how old he was, but he certainly looked much too advanced in years to be capable of the feats of endurance which he performed daily. He had the untiring enthusiasm of a fox terrier, and had bullied and scolded more companies along the rocky road that leads to success than any half-dozen dance directors in the country, in spite of his handicap in being almost completely deaf. 
he had an almost miraculous gift of picking up the melodies for which it was his business to design dances without apparently hearing them he seemed to absorb them through the pores he had a blunt and arbitrary manner and invariably spoke his mind frankly and honestly a habit which made him strangely popular in a profession where the language of equivoque is cultivated almost as sedulously as in the circles of international diplomacy what johnson miller said to your face was official not subject to revision as soon as your back was turned and people appreciated this izzy's willowy friend summed him up one evening when the ladies of the ensemble were changing their practice clothes after a particularly strenuous rehearsal defending him against the southern girl who complained that he made her tired you bet he makes you tired she said so he does me i'm losing my girlish curves and i'm so stiff i can't lace my shoes but he knows his business and he's on the level which is more than you can say of most of these guys in the show business that's right agreed the southern girl's blonde friend he does know his business he's put over any amount of shows which would have flopped like dogs without him to stage the numbers the duchess yawned rehearsing always bored her and she had not been greatly impressed by what she had seen of the rose of america one will be greatly surprised if he can make a success of this show i confess i find it perfectly ridiculous isn't it the limit on it said the cherub arranging her golden hair at the mirror it makes me thick why on earth is ike putting it on the girl who knew everything there is always one in every company hastened to explain i heard all about that ike hasn't any of his own money in the thing he's getting twenty-five per cent of the show for running it the angel is the long fellow you see jumping around pilkington his name is well it'll need to be rockefeller later on said the blonde oh they'll get somebody down to fix it after we've been out on the road a couple of days said the cherub optimistically they always do i've seen worse shows than this turned into hits all it wants is a new book and lyrics and a different score and a new set of principles said the red-headed babe did you ever see such a bunch the duchess with another tired sigh arched her well-shaped eyebrows and studied the effect in the mirror one wonders where they pick these persons up she assented languidly they remind me of a headline i saw in the paper this morning tons of hams unfit for human consumption are any of you girls coming my way i can give two or three of you a lift in my limousine sorry dear and thanks ever so much said the cherub but i instructed clarence my man to have the street car waiting on the corner and he'll be too upset if i'm not there nelly had an engagement to go and help one of the other girls buy a spring suit a solemn rite which it is impossible to conduct by oneself and jill and the cherub walked to the corner together jill had become very fond of the little thing since rehearsals began she reminded her of a london sparrow she was so small and perky and so absurdly able to take care of herself limousine snorted the cherub the duchess concluding speech evidently still rankled she gives me a pain in the gizzard hasn't she got a limousine asked jill of course she hasn't she's engaged to be married to a demonstrator in the speedwell auto company and he sneaks off when he can get away and gives her joy rides that's all a limousine she's got it beats me why girls in the show business are always so crazy to make themselves out vamps with a dozen millionaires on a string if may wouldn't fourflush and act like the belle of the moulin rouge she'd be the nicest girl you ever met she's mad about the fellow she's engaged to and wouldn't look at all the millionaires in new york if you brought em to her on a tray she's going to marry him as soon as he's saved enough to buy the furniture and then she'll settle down and harlem somewhere and cook and mind the baby and regularly be one of the lower middle classes all that's wrong with may is that she's read gingery stories and thinks that's a way a girl has to act when she's in the chorus that's funny said jill i should never have thought it i swallowed the limousine whole the cherub looked at her curiously jill puzzled her jill had indeed been the subject of much private speculation among her colleagues this is your first show isn't it she asked yes they what are you doing in the chorus anyway getting scolded by mr miller mostly it seems to me scolded by mr miller why didn't you say bawled out by johnny that's what any of the rest of us would have said well i've lived most of my life in england you can't expect me to talk the language yet i thought you were english you've got an accent like the fellow who plays the dude in this show say why did you ever get into the show business well well why did you why does anybody why did i oh i belong there i'm a regular broadway rat i wouldn't be happy anywhere else 
I was born in the show business. I got two thithters in the two-a-day and a brother in thock in California, and Dad's one of the best comedians in the burlesque wheel. But any one can see you're different. There's no reason why you should be sticking around in the chorus. But there is. I've no money, and I can't do anything to make it. Honest? Honest. That's tough. The cherub pondered, her round eyes searching Jill's face. Why don't you get married? Jill laughed. Nobody's asked me. Somebody thune will, at least, if he's on the level, and I think he is. You can generally tell by the look of a guy, and if you ask me, friend Pilkington's got the license on his pocket, and the ring all ordered and everything. Pilkington? cried Jill, aghast. She remembered certain occasions during rehearsals when, while the chorus idled in the body of the theatre and listened to the principals working at their scenes, the elongated Pilkington had suddenly appeared in the next seat and conversed sheepishly in a low voice. Could this be love? If so, it was a terrible nuisance. Jill had had her experience in London of enamoured young men who, running true to national form, declined to know when they were beaten, and she had not enjoyed the process of cooling their ardour. She had a kind heart, and it distressed her to give pain. It also got on her nerves to be dogged by stricken males who tried to catch her eye in order that she might observe their broken condition. She recalled one house party in Wales, where it rained all the time, and she had been cooped up with a victim who kept popping out from obscure corners, and beginning all his pleas with the words, "'I say, you know!' She trusted that Otis Pilkington was not proposing to conduct a wooing on those lines yet he had certainly developed a sinister habit of popping out at the theatre. On several occasions he had startled her by appearing at her side as if he had come out of a trap. "'Oh, no!' cried Jill. "'Oh, yes!' insisted the cherub, waving imperiously to an approaching street-car. "'Well, I must be getting up town. I've got a date. See you later.' "'I'm sure you're mistaken.' "'I'm not. But what makes you think so?' The cherub placed a hand on the rail of the car, preparatory to swinging herself on board. "'Well, for one thing,' she said, "'he's been stalking you like an Indian ever since we left the theatre. Look behind you. Good-bye, honey. Send me a piece of the cake.' The street-car bore her away. The last that Jill saw of her was a wide and amiable grin. Then turning, she beheld the snake-like form of Otis Pilkington towering at her side. Mr. Pilkington seemed nervous but determined. His face was half hidden by the silk scarf that muffled his throat, for he was careful of his health and had a fancied tendency to bronchial trouble. Above the scarf a pair of mild eyes gazed down at Jill through their tortoise-shell-rimmed spectacles. It was hopeless for Jill to try to tell herself that the tender gleam behind the glass was not the love-light in Otis Pilkington's eyes. The truth was too obvious. "'Good evening, Miss Mariner,' said Mr. Pilkington, his voice sounding muffled and far away through the scarf. "'Are you going uptown?' "'No, downtown,' said Jill quickly. "'So am I,' said Mr. Pilkington. Jill felt annoyed, but helpless. It was difficult to bid a tactful farewell to a man who has stated his intention of going in the same direction as yourself. There was nothing for it but to accept the unspoken offer of Otis Pilkington's escort. They began to walk down Broadway together. "'I suppose you are tired after the rehearsal?' inquired Mr. Pilkington, in his precise voice. He always spoke as if he were weighing each word and clipping it off a reel. "'A little. Mr. Miller is very enthusiastic.' "'About the piece?' Her companion spoke eagerly. "'No, I mean hard-working.' "'Has he said anything about the piece?' "'Well, no. You see, he doesn't confide in us a great deal except to tell us his opinion of the way we do the steps.' I don't think we impress him very much, to judge from what he says, but the girls say he always tells every chorus he rehearses that it is the worst he ever had anything to do with. And the cor uh, er, the ladies of the ensemble, what do they think of the piece? Well, I don't suppose they are very good judges, are they? said Jill diplomatically. You mean they do not like it? Some of them don't seem quite to understand it. Mr. Pilkington was silent for a moment. "'I am beginning to wonder myself whether it may not be a little over the heads of the public,' he said ruefully, when it was first performed. "'Oh, has it been done before?' "'By amateurs, yes, at the house of my aunt, Mrs. Wadsley Pegram, at Newport, last summer, in aid of the Armenian orphans. It was extraordinarily well received on that occasion. We nearly made our expenses. It was such a success that, I feel I can confide in you, I should not like this repeated to your, your, the other ladies.' 
it was such a success that against my aunt's advice i decided to give it a broadway production between ourselves i am shouldering practically all the expenses of the undertaking mr goble has nothing to do with the financial arrangements of the rose of america those are entirely in my hands mr goble in return for a share of the profits is giving us the benefit of his experience as regards the management and booking of the piece i have always had the greatest faith in it trevis and i wrote it when we were in college together and all our friends thought it exceptionally brilliant my aunt as i say was opposed to the venture she holds the view that i am not a good man of business in a sense perhaps she is right temperamentally no doubt i am more the artist but i was determined to show the public something superior to the so-called broadway successes which are so terribly trashy unfortunately i am beginning to wonder whether it is possible with the crude type of actor at one's disposal in this country to give a really adequate performance of such a play as the rose of america these people seem to miss the spirit of the piece its subtle topsy-turvy humour its delicate whimsicality this afternoon mr pilkington choked this afternoon i happened to overhear two of the principals who were not aware that i was within earshot discussing the play one of them these people expressed themselves curiously one of them said that he thought it a quince and the other described it as a piece of gorgonzola cheese that is not the spirit that wins success jill was feeling immensely relieved after all it seemed this poor young man merely wanted sympathy not romance she had been mistaken she felt about that gleam in his eyes it was not the love-light it was the light of panic he was the author of the play he had sunk a large sum of money in its production he had heard people criticizing it harshly and he was suffering from what her colleagues in the chorus would have called cold feet it was such a human emotion and he seemed so like an overgrown child pleading to be comforted that her heart warmed to him relief melted her defences and when on their arrival at thirty-fourth street mr pilkington suggested that she partake of a cup of tea at his apartment which was only a couple of blocks away off madison avenue she accepted the invitation without hesitating on the way to his apartment mr pilkington continued in the minor key he was a great deal more communicative than she herself would have been to such a comparative stranger as she was but she knew that men were often like this over in london she had frequently been made the recipient of the most intimate confidences by young men whom she had met for the first time the same evening at a dance she had been forced to believe that there was something about her personality that acted on a certain type of man like the crack in the dam setting loose the surging flood of their eloquence to this class otis pilkington evidently belonged for once started he withheld nothing it isn't that i'm dependent on aunt olive or anything like that he vouchsafed as he stirred the tea in his japanese print hung studio but you know how it is aunt olive is in a position to make it very unpleasant for me if i do anything foolish at present i have reason to know that she intends to leave me practically all that she possesses millions said mr pilkington handing jill a cup i assure you millions but there is a hard commercial strain in her it would have the most prejudicial effect upon her if especially after she had expressly warned me against it i were to lose a great deal of money over this production she is always complaining that i am not a business man like my late uncle mr wadsley pegram made a fortune in smoked hams mr pilkington looked at the japanese prince and shuddered slightly right up to the time of his death he was urging me to go into the business i could not have endured it but when i heard those two men discussing the play i almost wished that i had done so jill was now completely disarmed she would almost have patted this unfortunate young man's head if she could have reached it i shouldn't worry about the piece she said i've read somewhere or heard somewhere that it's the surest sign of a success when actors don't like a play mr pilkington drew his chair an imperceptible inch nearer how sympathetic you are jill perceived with chagrin that she had been mistaken after all it was the love-light the tortoise-shell rimmed spectacles sprayed it all over her like a couple of searchlights otis pilkington was looking exactly like a sheep and she knew from past experience that that was the infallible sign when young men looked like that it was time to go i'm afraid i must be off she said thank you so much for giving me tea i shouldn't be a bit afraid about the play i'm sure it's going to be splendid good-bye you aren't going already i must i'm very late as it is i promised whatever fiction jill might have invented to the detriment of her soul was interrupted by a ring at the bell the steps of mr pilkington's japanese servant crossing the hall came faintly to the sitting-room 
Mr. Pilkington in? Otis Pilkington motioned pleadingly to Jill. Don't go, he urged. It's only a man I know. He has probably come to remind me that I am dining with him tonight. He won't stay a minute. Please don't go. Jill sat down. She had no intention of going now. The cheery voice at the front door had been the cheery voice of her long-lost uncle, Major Christopher Selby. End of chapter 11 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com